The following program was produced thanks to a grant from the Sonora Rotary. Rotary. Service above self. Good morning and welcome. First, let me explain that the County of Tuolumne would not consent to us having a public dedication due to the constraints on the COVID because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, Keith Dale Wan, Veterans of Foreign War, Post 4748, in conjunction with Access Tuolumne, Comcast Public Access Channel 8, we are filming a virtual dedication ceremony today, Monday, September the 7th, 2020. First, I want to talk about the people that are doing the filming. Jerry Day runs Access Tuolumne for Comcast. He's a, a very experienced and, and uh, longtime film man. He, he's, he's produced a uh, series and done a number of things. Alex Miller is with him. Alex works at Black Oak. He's a Marine Corps veteran of the war in Afghanistan. Love to have these people here today so that we can get our message out that we want to get out. My name is Frank Madison Smart. I'm a Vietnam veteran, having served as a combat reporter for the 1st Cavalry Division newspaper, The Cavalier, from 19, April 68 to April 69. Myself, along with Iraq War veteran Aaron Rasmussen, are the co-creators of this 9-11 Global War on Terrorism Memorial, built here on the East Lawn of Tuolumne Township Veteran Memorial Hall. I have, for the past 15 months, served as the project manager and construction coordinator of the memorial, and it has indeed been an honor. The memorial actually began with two veterans, Aaron and myself, having a common goal with different ideas. Aaron wanted to build a memorial honoring those who lost their lives in what we now know as 9-11. I had, for several years, wanted to build a memorial honoring the men and women who fought the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and are still fighting those wars. Over one, lunch one day at Perco's, Aaron and I decided to combine our ideas together and create this memorial. I'll explain more about how this beautiful, meaningful, and emotional memorial came into being later on. Now I'm going to turn this over to uh, the gentleman who became my assistant project manager, former commander of VFW Post 4748, Richard Polly. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. My name is Richard Polly. I'm the past commander of the Keith Dale Wan Veterans of Foreign Wars, post 4748. And I'd like to offer my welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to introduce some special guests today. Um, Aaron Rasmussen, former post commander and All-American district commander. Frank Smart. These two, these two gentlemen came up with this idea and I think they did a pretty good job today. Uh, Mike Warden, the architect. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's see. Lieutenant Denny Thompson. United States Air Corps, World War II, and D-Day. Thank you for coming, sir. Uh, Post Commander Richard DeGorio. He's back in the back. He'll be on the honor guard. Post 3154 Sonora Commander Robert Phillips. Thank you, sir. And also the DAV president. There you go. Stand up twice. Thank you, sir. District 13 commander, Kevin Hakich. Thank you, sir. Okay. And Department of California, senior vice commander, Dusty Napier. It's an honor. Um, Department of California Adjutant Quartermaster, Roger Meyer. Thank you, sir. 
And it's a true honor today. We have the Department Commander of California, John Lowe. Thank you. Sir. So everyone, please stand. Post the colors, the half staff. Present Holmes. Chaplain Dan Hillier, please give the invocation. Good morning. Let us bow our heads. O sovereign ruler of the universe, who art the Lord of hosts and God of peace, without thee our efforts are in vain. We thank you for this day and ask your blessings for all the veterans, first responders, firemen, police officers, and their families and all who are here today to show their support. Please lay your comforting hand on those who have lost loved ones caring for our citizens in the defense of our country. We will now have a moment of silent prayer for our departed comrades and those missing in action and those who gave their all protecting our citizens. These and all other necessary blessings we ask of thee. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Present arms. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Order, harms. Please be seated. We have a um, couple of more guests that are here that I forgot to introduce. One is uh, John Madrigal, President of uh, Veterans of Vietnam Veterans of America, and also chair Committee Chairman of the uh, Tuolumne County Veterans Committee. Thank you, John, for coming. And and uh, our most important guest today, Candace Olson. Thank you. And also, please welcome her mom and dad, Mr. and Mrs. Olson. Thank you. 
And just arriving, thanks guys for coming. Tuolumne District Fire Department is here. Jeff Santee. Thank you. And the Chief here. Chief. Morning, Nick Oler. Thank, Thank you, sir. Yeah, happy to be here. Okay. On September 11th, 2001, at approximately 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. At 9.03 a.m., United Airlines Flight 175 crashed into the South Tower. 9.05 a.m., President Bush was told of the crash. 9.36 a.m., Vice President Cheney was evacuated to the Office of the President's Emergency Operations Center. 9.37 a.m., American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon. At that time, the White House and the Capitol were ev evacuated. 9.59 a.m., the South Tower collapses. 600 workers and first responders were killed. 10.03 a.m., Flight 93 crashes into a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. 10.25 a.m., the North Tower collapses. Approximately 1,400 people were killed. The events of that day killed nearly 3,000 people. These were police officers, firefighters, EMTs, military personnel, and many innocent civilians. Many went into those buildings to save lives. About four years ago, two members of our post were having a conversation. Frank and Aaron were, were talking about building a, a memorial to honor those who had died that day. The 9-11 Global War on Terror Memorial was born. They decided to raise funds by selling memorial bricks. One day, they were approached by a young lady her name was Candace Olson. She was a senior at Somerville High School. And for her senior project, she wanted to help local veterans. When she was told about the plan for the memorial, she decided to help raise the funds we would need. After months of hard work and several fundraisers, she came to our post meeting and presented the post with a check for almost $73,000. An agreement was made with Sonora Area Foundation to hold the funds for the project until needed. In June 2019, we broke ground and construction began. Candace, we received a letter several months ago from the Sonora Area Foundation informing us we had enough funds to finish the project. Thanks to your efforts and the generous people of this community, Money continued to flow in to the Sonora Area Foundation in your name, and they have given you credit for raising over $94,000. <laughs> Candace, we cannot thank you enough. For us and the many vet veterans who will come here in the future from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Candace Olson. Hi everyone, my name is Candace Olson. First off, I'd like to say just how humbled and honored I am to be a part of such a special dedication. Um, I'm now a sophomore in college at the University of Nevada, but when I was, or during my senior year of high school, when I had first chose to do this senior project, I had no clue, like, I had no clue the goals that we would surpass and everything that we'd be able to do. Um, we reached far beyond our goal and I learned many valuable life lessons, but I also gained many valuable friendships from all the men here today and all the veterans I was able to work so closely with. 
Post 4748 has given me so much more than I could have asked for, and I'd like to thank them all for their support and their compassion that they've shown me. Without the endless hard work of all these veterans here today, the community support and help from local businesses who donated to this project, we would not have been able to create something as meaningful and special as this. The support for this project surpassed my expectations more than I ever could have thought of, and I will, be ever, I will forever be grateful for the opportunity that I was given to be a part of this. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Rasmus. Great to see all of you today. It's um, my name is Aaron Rasmussen, born and raised here in Tuolumne. I was in Iraq from 04 to 05, served 12 years, came back to this beautiful community in about 2014. I'm glad to be here in my hometown again. <clears throat> Hopefully, I have some words of encouragement for everyone today. We live in a country where the, we have the greatest prosperities and liberties known to man. But with those great sacrifices are needed throughout our community. We witnessed those moments in, during 9-11 in which many Americans gave selfless service for their country. From the struggles on Flight 93 to stop that plane destination, to the men and women who ran towards towers that were about ready to fall, to the men and women around this nation that thereafter joined military service to serve their country as needed. The American spirit of selfless service is summed up by JFK's words. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Today we are facing another tragedy like that of 9-11 that is affecting all of us. In the early days of this current pandemic, we witnessed all Americans sacrificing their businesses, sacrificing their livelihoods for the greater cause and the safety of our nation. But like 9-11 that produced the controversial Patriots Act, today we are facing that same discussion of what we should do in the face of the terror of pandemics. We must remember the words of Benjamin, Frank Benjamin Franklin. Those who will give up essential liberties to purchase a little temporary safety deserves neither liberty nor safety. Today I'm going to ring this Liberty Bell in the memory of those that have perished first at the towers. Those that perished in Shanksville. Those that perished at the Pentagon. Those that perished in Iraq. And those that perished in Afghanistan.
This memorial will stand forever. Forever for us to remember all those sacrifices. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Aaron. That's very emotional, that ringing of the bell to honor all those people. Uh, that's something that we will continue to do in the years to come. We're already talking about what we're going to do here on this spot in the years to come. And we will, we will do it. Uh, I, before I get into my speech, I, my speech is entitled The Anatomy of a Memorial. In other words, how did this memorial get to be here? But before that, I want to talk about the little engine that could. You all heard that story, the little engine that could? Well, this is the little VFW that could. This little VFW was state. Uh, Commander, tell me what I'm talking about here. What, what, Richard, what were the awards you won? The state? All state. All state and all, an all-American post. That's a small post with 60 to 70 members in a small community like this. And then to build this memorial, uh, which is a very extensive memorial, probably the largest in Tuolumne County. This is the little engine that could right here, let me tell you. Uh, it did it because he's got a small but very vibrant cadre of men and women who belong to this post who believe in it and believe what we're doing. And we have some more plans for the future coming up uh, in conjunction with Post 3154 to build up the memberships of these two of these two VFWs and uh, that those, those plans were put aside because of this pandemic but we will revise them again okay now my purpose is to explain how this all happened like I said I'll start with Aaron and I Mike Wharton come along Mike's a retired landscape architect and he started taking Aaron's ideas and making some drawings we brought Jerry Ficillo in Jerry's a longtime engineer in Tuolumne County and uh, what we were looking for was a design that we could get the county to agree to allow us to build on this location. First, we had to go through the Historical Preservation Review Committee about four times. They had some changes they wanted made. We accommodated them. Then we went to the Board of Supervisors in February, the, I believe it was February the 18th of 2018. They gave us permission to build. Now, we had a, we had a building permit. We had no money. Along come this lovely lady back here, Candace Olson. Rescued us old veterans. Raised that money for us, and now we were ready to go. Like she said, she learned some, some life lessons out there. She was, her mother helped her greatly. They, her whole family was involved. They, they just did a great job. Then we initially had that 73000 It later became 94000 And then Sonora Area Foundation gave us $12,000. And then we've raised money by selling these commemorative bricks, and we're still selling them. We'll never forget Candace, and we'll make sure that she's immortalized on this memorial for everyone to know what she did. Uh, so we were off and running. First volunteer contractor to step up was Brett Taylor, the masonry contractor. He was also Candace's mentor on her senior project. Brett and his crew built the back wall and the two pedestals. And then they moved on. That gave us something to build to. At that point, I began seeking out professional concrete, concrete con contractors. And up steps a young man with a servant's heart named Mark Mathis. He owns a company called Concrete Creations. He poured the back ramp and then asked me, well, who's going to pour the platform, Frank? And I said, I guess you are. And he did. Uh, then a Robert Boyer, Robert Boyer Construction brought Luke Taylor out here, who's the nephew of Brett Taylor, and had been involved in the project early on. And he came out after WebCore out of San Francisco. Mike Wharton had a connection there, and they came out and framed it. Luke poured it. Then we brought in Larry Sakula. He grew up out here, has family here. Him and his nephew, Danny Robles, come out and poured the, the tops of these two pedestals. Dave Turner and Mitch Wilson both worked on those also. Then along come Mindy and, uh, Cindy and Mark Harlan, owners of AGS Construction. They stepped up to pour the sidewall 
and the curbing around the seating area. Uh, Jerry Fortuna and, and Tyler did that. Uh, early on, uh, Richard Polly, who lives right across the street and was the commander of the VFW, just started coming over and helping. He brought tools with him. He worked. He, he, he uh, spent a lot of hours out here, so I made him my assistant project commander, uh, manager. Now, many days on this lot right here, Richard Polly, at age 70, was the youngest man out here. Okay? The youngest man at age 70. This is, this is the old veterans project, if you want to call it that. We had people that just were so great. And by the way, I want to thank Richard's wife, uh, 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 Tina, for letting him come out and play with us. Yeah. <laughs> but we had guys like, and guys, I'm going to have your, your ages wrong, but that's okay. Uh, people like Dan Hillier, 74, Louis Reyes, 86 years old, who served in the United States Army in Korea, the Frozen Chosen Reservoir. His nephew, his young nephew, thank you, Louis. His young nephew was only 77. He came out here and helped us, too. Uh, I'm 80. Reggie, I think, Reggie's 74. Jerry Disney's 74. And then there were the young guys that come out and helped us. Tom Allen, Dave Pineda, Tom Hillier, Mike Nitzler, Sam Santee. Stevie Huntoon, Ryan Rays. Uh, these are men in their 40s and 50s and 60s. They were the kids that were out here. So early in the project, Gene Alley of Alley Tree come on board, volunteered to do the de decomposed granite seating area. Longtime friend and fellow Vietnam veteran Ron Sutton, an electrical contractor, signed on to do the electrical work. <clears throat> this was the second memorial that Ron and I worked on. Uh, he also did the electrical at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial at the library. Long come Bill Shivo, a Vietnam era veteran and, uh, that uh, was an electrician. Ron got hurt, Bill took over. Mark Weber come out and helped, another Vietnam era veteran. And Darren Eaton of Clink Electric is also involved. But throughout the project, we had people volunteer or people that I sought out or that someone else sought out, or that someone knew. Someone said, hey, can you come help? And they just said yes. Some said no because they couldn't. Uh, no one, no one said no because they didn't want to. They said no because they didn't have the time or the manpower. They never said no because they didn't want to. A lot of people gave up their free time. They gave up their time at work to come out here and help us with this. Harold Winters loaned us the vibrating machine we needed. David Fry laid these bricks. Israel D. Herrera, another Vietnam veteran, a longtime friend, helped us by consulting with us on various aspects. And then we had, thank goodness, probationers from the Tuolumne County Probation Department come out of here because they're all young, stout men, okay? They had a lot of digging to do out here. And I cannot say enough about James Wood and his crew from the Tuolumne Parks and Recreation Department, which is located right across the street. They allowed us to use the basement of this building for storage, his corporation yard for storage. He loaned us his equipment, his men, they come over here and helped us many times. Did a great job for it. Tuolumne Sewer District had a hand. Uh, men from my church I go to, Calvary Chapel, came out one day and did a great job compacting backfill. All my guys commented about how hard they worked. I said they worked as if we were paying them. Did a great job. Joe Walton helped us. CQ Plastering from Oakdale did this beautiful plastering job. Mike Santee, the father of one of our new VFW members, Sam Santee did the bricks, the little red bricks you see up here, we call the soldier course. Uh, then there was the suppliers. George Reed Incorporated donated about 140 yards of Class II aggregate that we needed. 7-Eleven Materials, which is an arm of George Reed, and Steve Domder sitting right over here, donated half the concrete for this project. And Steve Domter has a special connection. This VFW post is named Keith Dale Wan, VFW post 4748, after a young man who grew up here and died in World War II. Keith Domter is his great nephew. Is that right, Steve? Great nephew. So that's a small town America connection there. You can only get in these small towns. I love that part. So, uh, you know, we're moving on. We had other, like ABC materials up here on, on Tuolumne Road. Jeffrey Tillman, the manager, was 
more than generous loaning business uh, building materials to us. Boone's Memorial carved these three commemorative bricks, commemorative stones back here, and we had to get the largest crane in the company in the county to come out here. That was Kevin's cranes. That metal stone weighs 2,600 pounds. The other two weigh 1,600 pounds. Sean McCamish at Granite Peak Alarms installed the security cameras there on 24-7 recording. Gino Catrone, G7 Concrete Cutting, come out several occasions and going to come out with some more. Lowe's, Sonora Lumber Company, Sonora Reynolds were also involved. Joe Cover and Sons helped raise this flagpole. And speaking of the flagpoles, I want to introduce to you a special lady. Her name is Flo Griggs. Flo, would you stand up? Flo Griggs donated this flagpole to this memorial. Now, that wasn't my first connection with Flo. When I was building the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, a young man come along that wanted to do a, a senior project, I mean a uh, Eagle Scout project, and he raised money for the flagpole of the library. The way he raised it was he sold an inch for three, uh, an inch was $3.50. You could buy as many inches as you wanted, and she bought most of the inches. <laughs> so, Great lady, great lady, great friend. John Nestle, American Made Masonry, came out. Mark Alderson put up the fence around this memorial, and I said, we'll be here about, I'll need about three months. That three months turned into 15 months, and he never charged us a dime for it. Then there's, right up here, there's a square you may see, a gray square. That's going to be a time capsule. I had long wanted to do a time capsule, never had a place to put it. This afforded me that opportunity. Uh, the capsule is special. Now, the reason I picked the guy that made it back in Prospect, Pennsylvania, Time Capsules Incorporated, Tom Marek is a veteran. He has a special and unique process. He has built the, he has built the, the two, two foot by two foot by 18 inch high stainless steel time capsule. I will ship all of my merchandise, all the materials I've gathered over the past year and a half to him later this month. He will put it inside the capsule, then he will put a bag of desiccant in there. Desiccant, you, if you open up a bottle of medicine, there's a little bag in there, that's desiccant. Puts that in there, he has a special neoprene seal that goes around it, he puts the cap on it and bolts it down every inch all the way around. Then in the side of that box is a port. He sucks all the air out and puts argon gas back in it. The argon gas reacts with the desiccant, and those fumes protect anything, paper, cardboard, wood, metal, pictures, rubber, it doesn't matter. It protects it. So one day, in a phone call, Tom says to me, he said, Frank, uh, my, my process is guaranteed for 500 years. I said, well, how would you know that? But, you know, I said, I'm only interested in 56 years. This time capsule, hopefully, will be opened on Saturday, the 4th of July, 2076. That's the tricentennial of America. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, now, I intend to be here. In an urn. Okay. Candace could be here. Candace will be a young 75-year-old lady. She could certainly be here, and I hope she is. I think that would be a great day for her, you know. Uh, but we had we had help again. I asked people to help, and they said, "Yeah." Uh, John Bright, longtime friend, Vietnam veteran, uh, was on that committee. Aaron, our friend Margette Welton, Kristen Kelty, Lynn Ann Blake, who's here today, Vicki Hirsch, who's here today, and the late Sam Smith, all helped up gather up things to put in there. A lot of people wouldn't respond; didn't want to put anything in there. But we got what we got. Then last but not least, over here behind this pedestal is a black box, a display case. It's made out of steel, got bulletproof glass on the top. And in that display case will be three authentic artifacts of the three major crash sites of 9-11. I spent two years making telephone calls, writing letters, and doing emails to get those three authentic artifacts. One is a piece of steel from the Twin Towers. Came to us through Dan Pinnell or Dan Pinnell Carpeting. I have a piece of limestone from the Pentagon crash site and a piece of lime, uh, sandstone rock that was dug up 
when Flight 93 dove into a field near Stony Creek uh, County, Pennsylvania, near Shanksville, which is now a museum and national park. So, uh, I want to also say, I forgot to say that the time capsule was purchased through money that was donated by Roger and Judy Houghton, longtime friends and good supporters and people I knew from Habitat for Humanity. So, that basically is is how a, muse, how a monument like this gets built. Uh, the steel cabinet was built by uh, Jim Fernandez at Prozap Welding, who's just an artist with metal. So you know the businesses, individuals, organizations, everybody contributed their part to this beautiful, meaningful, and emotional memorial. May it stand the ravages of time and memorial as a testament to the American spirit. A memorial to those who perished in the crashes and those who tried to rescue them. To the men and women who have fought for our rights and our way of life. As the new tower stands with the memorial at the base in New York City, both the large one and this small one are testament that Americans can be knocked to their knees, but they can't be knocked out. Well, that's what happened to us on 9-11. We got knocked to our knees. We were all stunned and saddened and scared. The Americans got up off their knees the next day and started taking care of business, and they're still taking care of business, and they will continue to take care of business. My minister, Mark McMahon, Miles McMahon, summed it up for me when talking about what's going on in our country today. He says, real simple, God's in charge. Don't worry about it. Thank you. Okay, just a little housekeeping here. She snuck in when I wasn't looking. But the lady that kept me going all last year and helped me uh, become and uh, obtain this hat. Been married to her for 39 years. Please welcome my wife, Tina. Hey, Tina. Well, you thought you could hide behind the tree? <laughs> I get you. Okay, Mindy, would you come up and sing? Ladies and gentlemen, Wendy Lancaster. Would you all please stand? Jay Chud, present her. I'll be singing the uh, national anthem today. <clears throat> oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Who oh, said as that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the and the home of the brave. Order. Her. Thank you. You stay up here with me. You stay up here with me. You're okay. I don't mind being seen in public with you. Well, most of the time I don't. I forgot to mention Roger Olson. Roger Olson is Candace's dad. His son, John, they did all the excavation out here. You, know, you don't see it, but there's a lot of holes under this. He was not just being a volunteer, he was being a daddy and supporting his daughter, okay? And that's great, John, we appreciate it. 
you, you, you and Roger, we appreciate you. And Kathleen, getting to know Kathleen Olson, it's been a pleasure. John Barbera, Barbera, uh, boy, I mean, we can talk about different things, but he was there. He was there. He was a fire captain at a fire department there on Staten Island. And he went, he went to ground zero that morning, and he saw the devastation. And then he had to go back to his station and organize his company. Uh, he lost two of his men that morning and organized his people because they still had to fight fires other, other places in the city. They had to be prepared for that. And then set up a schedule where his people could rotate in and out of the rescue effort at Ground Zero. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. My name is John LaBarbera, executive board member of the Stephen Silla Tunnel to Towers Foundation and a retired FDNY Battalion Commander of Battalion 2-3 in Staten Island. I salute Tulumi Township and all of the wonderful volunteers who participated in making your magnificent memorials. Frank Smart, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak today. We have the same mission. Never forget the sacrifices that were made and are still being made by our first responders and our military. Though there were many first responders and civilian heroes, I am going to speak about four heroes on that fateful day. We just had a, a plane crash into Alpha 4 of the World Trade Center, transmit a second alarm, and start relocating companies in the area. All right, attention all units, by the order of Citywide Corps Commander, all off duty firefighters and all off duty. Officers are hereby recall, repeating, by the orders of the Citywide Tour Commander, all off-duty firefighters and all off-duty officers, we are hereby ordered for recall immediately. Squad 1-8 to Manhattan, Jay. Squad 1-8, Jay. It's the first battalion transmitted that it looked like it was intentional. It's four, it's four more units going into the box. It could be a terrorist attack. On the 19th anniversary of September 11th, all first responders need to ensure our country never forgets. Sacrifices are still being made by men and women who worked in the rubble of Ground Zero. 9-11 cancer deaths have surpassed the number of lives taken by the attack itself. This was an attack on each and every one of us, our freedom and our way of life. First responders pass the torch of freedom to a heroic military. The iconic picture of the flag being raised at Ground Zero told the world we are back on our feet and ready for the challenge. 19 years ago, I was a fire captain in Brooklyn. My firehouse was located 20 minutes away from the towers. We lost two members of our unit that day, Joe Greslak and Mike Pacino. I was supposed to work that day. One of my lieutenants needed a weekend free, so we had switched off. Back then, I would help my wife and two daughters get out of the house for work and school and on my days off, I'd be at your gym at 9 a.m. After seeing the second plane go into the South Tower, I knew we were under attack. I jumped in my car and headed to the ferry to get to Manhattan. When you arrive, it's a straight half mile walk to the towers. It was complete and utter devastation. I still can't find the words to truly describe what we all witnessed. I was able to find 
all my men, except Joe and Mike. They never returned to our firehouse. I needed to go back to Brooklyn to organize my men into a schedule to assist in rescue efforts while still maintaining fire and emergency coverage of my fire protection area. My house's fire engine was still in Manhattan in really bad shape. Thankfully, while still unsure of how I was going to do this, I received a call from headquarters that the amazing states around the metro area will begin arriving shortly with their engines and ladders to assist in coverage. The sight of those trucks arriving in the city was something I will never forget. This is only a small part of a whole saga of stories from that day. The Stephen Silla Tunnel to Towers Foundation honors the heroes who risk their lives every day for you and me. Heroes like Stephen Silla, an FDNY firefighter for Squad One in Brooklyn, who gave his life, saving others, September 11th. Heroes like Officer Smith, like Stephen, rushed to the scene to fulfill her duty. Saving lives came to Maura Smith at an early age. In the seventh grade, she spotted a friend drowning in a pool at summer camp. Her ability to think quickly had saved her friend's life. When it came time to choose a college major, she chose criminal justice. After college, Smith entered the police academy and graduated in December of 1988. Her first assignment was police in the subways, which, at the time, was an extremely dangerous tour. Underground conditions made radio transmissions impossible, and you could not contact your unit for assistance. In August of 91, a runaway train derailed, injuring hundreds of passengers. The worst disaster of the New York subway's 63-year history. Police Officer Smith was ending her nine-hour shift at Union Station in Manhattan when she was alerted to the crash. She went into life-saving mode once again, assisting trapped passengers on the train. Smith helped set up a triage area and administered first aid to numerous passengers and continued working for the next 24 hours. Conditions on the ground were extremely dangerous from the smoke, fire, and electrical hazards. Additionally, carbon monoxide was present due to the tunnel's exhaust fans failing. Maura Smith was awarded with a Distinguished Duty Medal for saving dozens of lives that day. In 1999, Maura and her husband had their daughter Patricia. Smith changed assignments and transferred to a community where she had fewer chances of interacting with dangerous criminals. On September 11th, Police Officer Smith was patrolling the 13th Precinct when she witnessed a plane striking one of the Twin Towers. After notifying her dispatcher, she rushed to the scene. Many of the details of what Mora did that day will never be known, but survivors recall her bravery. Edward Nichols was making his way down from the 102nd floor when Officer Smith spotted him injured and bleeding badly. She guided him out of the South Tower and into a triage area where a photographer captured a picture of them. Smith went back into the tower where she became the only female first responder to be killed on 9-11. Maura Smith turned her dream of saving lives into a career she loved. Although ending tragically, she is kept alive to her family, friends, and life she touched 
and the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. Chief of Department, Peter J. Gancy, Jr. Chief Gancy served as the highest ranking uniform member of the New York City Fire Department. He was promoted to the Chief of Department a five-star rank in October of 1999. He was in charge of 12,000 firefighters and fire officers, the largest firefighting force in the United States. Prior to joining the FDNY, he served as a volunteer fireman and he served in the 82nd Airborne Division during Vietnam. In 1968, he joined the FDNY where he worked in the most active units of the Bronx and Brooklyn. On the morning of 9-11, Chief Gancy was scheduled for jury duty. At 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 hit the North Tower. Chief Gancy and his aide jumped in the car and moved to the site of the attack. He set up his command post by a garage near the North Tower just as United Flight 175 hit the South Tower at 9.03. Gancy and his staff took refuge in a basement area of the parking structure when the South Tower collapsed at 9.59. Chief Gancy and his men dug themselves out of the rubble and he ordered his staff to set up a new command post in a safer area further north as he feared the North Tower would fall at any minute. But Gancy did not follow his staff. He said, I am not leaving my men. He stood in front of the North Tower directing rescue efforts with two handy talkies, one speaking to his subordinate chiefs and the other to dispatches advising both of the situation and the need for a full citywide response. At 10.28 a.m., the North Tower collapsed, killing Chief of Department Peter Gancy, along with First Deputy Fire Commissioner Bill Feehan, who was with Peter. Gancy's staff pulled both of them out from under four feet of rubble. Fire Commissioner Safer said, Pete would never ask anyone to do something he wouldn't do himself. It didn't surprise me that he was at the front line with his men. You would never see him five miles away in some command center. Gancy was 54 years old, and he served 33 years in the FDNY. He is survived by his wife Kathleen, their sons Peter and Christopher, both firefighters, and his daughter Danielle. Next we have probationary firefighter Michael Dioria. Mike Dioria was sworn into the department May 2, 2001. He scored 100 on both the written and physical test. After training at the fire academy, he was assigned to Engine 40, Ladder 35 in Midtown Manhattan. Firefighter Dioria followed in the footsteps of his uncles where he became the ninth member of his family to become a firefighter. Last year, his nephew John entered into the department as the 10th. Firefighting was Mike's dream. While waiting to become one, he attended culinary school in Manhattan and went to work in a number of high-profile restaurants in the city. Whenever his fire brothers saw his name on the shift board, they knew they were in for a great meal. On top of being an excellent chef, he had a love of painting and reading. Mike once told his sister that when he dies, it will be in a way that will change the world. While these words resonate today, they reflect Dioria's spirituality. His mother said, forever is a long time, but you never realize it until you lose someone you love so dearly. Four months after he was sworn in, firefighter Mike Dior responded to his second fire of his career and was filmed walking into the South Tower with his unit. 
At 9.59 a.m., the South Tower collapsed, killing all members of Engine 40 and Ladder 35. He is survived by his mother, Nancy, his father, Carmine, his sister, Christina. Mike Dioria is my cousin. Earlier that same morning, firefighter Stephen Silla, assigned to Squad 1 in Brooklyn, was on his way to play golf with his three brothers. He had just finished his night tour when he got word over his scanner that a plane had flown into the North Tower. Stephen called his wife, Sally, and asked her to tell his brothers he would catch up with them later. Then he returned to Squad 1 to grab his gear. He drove his truck to the mouth of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, but it already had been closed for security reasons. This tunnel is a major thoroughfare that connects downtown Manhattan with the western side of Brooklyn. It is nearly two miles long. He strapped 60 pounds of gear, abandoned his truck with the keys on the dashboard, and ran on foot through the tunnel to the towers where he gave his life, saving others. Squad 1 suffered 100% casualties, and the remains of Stephen and his firefighter brothers were never recovered. He is survived by his wife, Sally, and his five children. Stephen's six older siblings started the Tunnel to Towers Foundation in his memory. Their greatest hope was to do good in tribute to their younger brother. Now, the foundation, it's on its way to $250 million in pledge support of our nation's greatest heroes and their families. Thank you to our sponsors, donors, and supporters for powering our efforts in aiding all of Stephen's brothers and sisters in uniform, first responders, and our military overseas and at home. Through you, we are able to do good. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. Tent. Hut. Present. Huh. Safety. Ready. Aim. Aim. Mindy, would you come up here and sing God Bless America? Okay. All right. I was asked by my, uh, my lovely friend and sister Jill to sing America the Beautiful for you today. So I'll see if I can get this going for you. Oh, beautiful, for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties, Above the fruited plains, America, America, God shed His grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from. Sea to shining sea, and crown thy good. 
good with pride I heard from sea to shining sea. Thank you. Thank you, Mindy. If y'all please be seated. Would you please welcome Department of California Commander John G. Lowe. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's an honor for me to be invited here today representing our state organization of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Um, it's amazing to see the work that a small post such as Tuolumne Post here uh, has, uh, has built this great memorial in, in honor of, of the 9-11, the folks that have lost their lives in 9-11 and on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's, it's amazing to see the amazing community work that, that has happened here in Tuolumne uh, with, the, with the Candace uh, doing what she did to, to bring this memorial uh, to life. Uh, all the, the construction companies and all the folks that provided the in-kind support to build this wonderful memorial. It's just an honor to be here today uh, and, and to enjoy in this. Um, I just want to, as an organization, this is a busy time for us this week. Um, and so let's just take a moment and reflect on everything that's occurred since 9-11 to honor those sacrifices and memories and to do exactly what this community is doing in this town is to recommit ourselves to our families, to our community, and to our country. You know, today we honor Patriot Day and, the, and, the, and this week is actually 9-11, we're honoring Patriot's Day and the memories of the approximately 3,000 folks that lost their lives at 9-11 over 19 years ago. So uh, this, is a, this is, a, is a really important time just for us to reflect and enjoy this memorial that you now have in your community. I do want to just say thank you to a couple of people to make this uh, possible. If I could have Candace come up here for a second. I just want to present Candace with uh, my, my coin for this year and just as an honor for the work that she did to put this together and raise such an enormous amount of money to, to support this, this great memorial. So thank you. Thank you. I also like to commend uh, Frank. Can you come on up here? I think uh, Frank could probably just stand up here. I don't, you said you were almost 80, I think is what you said. I am 80. 80. He could stand up here and, and speak forever, but I, and I think he's got a lot of stories to tell us. Uh, just last weekend, I had the uh, honor of uh, going to a birthday party for a, a World War II veteran just turned 100 years ago, 100 years old. And it's just it's an honor to, to see our members out there as being as active as, as in their younger ages are well, as we are and, yeah. as, as doing the things. So I want to present you one of our coins too. Thank you very much, Commander. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah. And I also want to uh, thank one of our, he was a post commander, he was a former department chairman and former district commander in our organization, Aaron. Thank you for all the work that you continue to do. Um, so again, like I said, just take this time, take this week, enjoy what, what these folks have built for you, and uh, just remember uh, to, to think about what this is all about. And as I said earlier, we want to honor the sacrifices of those that have lost their lives. We want to recommit ourselves to our families, our community, and to our country. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Today, 
We dedicate the memor this memorial in honor of all those who sacrificed all. So we may never forget their sacrifice every September 11th in the future, we will be here to honor their memory. We will always remember. Chaplain Dan, would you give our benediction, please? Almighty God, the hour is coming, we must part. We commit ourselves to thy care. Grant that in life's battles we may be strong and brave, and please watch over those who protect us every day as citizens. We ask thee to lay your protective hand on those who even now guard the gates of freedom. Amen. Yep. And ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our dedication for today. Thank you very much for coming. Hello. We want to talk to you about these uh, commemorative bricks in this walkway here. These bricks are to honor Many women who have served our country in uniform. That uniform could be the military, it could be law enforcement, firefighters, EMTs, first responders. Uh, these bricks will be here for a long time. So if there's anyone in your family, anyone in your circle of friends, they don't have to be from Tuolumne or live in Tuolumne. If it's just someone you want to honor, someone you love, admire, and respect for their service, uh, whatever that service was in the military and law enforcement and firefighting. Uh, we encourage you to purchase a brick to be in this walkway. This walkway will be here for a long time to come like this memorial will. So there'll be years where you can bring family and, and grandkids and great grandkids to see uh, their loved ones uh, honored in stone. Uh, the bricks cost, the, the large brick, the 8 by 8 brick cost $100, the 4 by 8 brick cost $50. We. Uh, you can go to the website at www.vfwpost4748 backslash memorial or contact me. I'll help you get a form, help you get it filled out and get it in. We encourage you to do this. Richard? Hi, my name is Richard Pauley and I'm the past commander of the Keith Dale Wan Veteran of Foreign Wars Post 4748. And not only am I a veteran, but I'm also a retired firefighter of almost 40 years. And I'd like to encourage each and every one of you, if you have a loved one that was in the fire service, if they were in law enforcement, or if they were an EMT or a paramedic, or you just have a loved one that you want to honor, buy a brick and place it here. This gray square wooden uh, top here is just a temporary top over what will become the time capsule that we are preparing for this memorial. The theme of the time capsule is the Fabric of Life, Tuolumne County, 2020. This time capsule, I picked the guy who has made this time capsule for us because of his unique approach to how he protects things inside the time capsule. Tom Merrick of Time Capsules Incorporated of Prospect, Pennsylvania has built a quarter inch stainless steel 24 by 24 by 18 box for us. I will ship the material that I've gathered over the last year and a half to him. He will put the material in the box and then he will add a large bag of desiccant. Desiccant is the material, when you open up a bottle of medicine, there's a little bag in there, that's desiccant. He then will put a neoprene seal around the top, bolt the top down. The side of the box has got a port in it, he'll suck all the air out and insert argon gas back into the box, that argon gas will react with the desiccant and that creates fumes that will protect anything, uh, paper, cardboard, pictures, uh, plastics, rubber, metal, wood, it doesn't matter what it is, it'll protect it. Tom says to me, my process is guaranteed for 500 years. I don't know, how would you know that? But anyhow, we're interested in 56 years. This memorial will be opened on Saturday, the 4th of July, 2076. 
That is the tricentennial of America. That's why we picked that date. So the people of 2076 will be able to go through this material that's in this box and see how we lived in Tuolumne County in the year 2020. This steel display case here houses three authentic artifacts from the three major crash sites of 9-11. I spent two years getting these uh, artifacts. I thought they were important because they are a direct link to the events of that day. This piece of white limestone cut in the shape of a pentagon is from the Pentagon crash site. This sandstone rock was dug up when Flight 93 went into the field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. This piece of steel is from the Twin Towers. That was given to us by Dan Pinnell of Pinnell's Carpeting of Sonora. Dan got the piece of steel because his company raised some money for the Stephen Siller Foundation. And all the, all the Carpet One dealers like Pinnell's who, who raised enough money got this award uh, to hang on their walls and he generously donated it to us. And the Stephen Siller Foundation was named after a young firefighter from New York. He was on his way home from work that morning when he heard about the crash into the Twin Towers. He turned his car around, went back to his firehouse, got his fire gear, drove his car towards the crash site, and got stuck in traffic in a tunnel. And he got out of his car and ran and walked the rest of the way to the, to the towers. And like so many others, he ran towards the fire instead of away from it. He went into the building and never came out. His family started the Stephen, Stephen Siller Foundation called the Stephen Siller Tunnels to Towers Foundation in reference to his being stuck in the tunnel and then running to the towers. And I didn't want to put these in a vault somewhere and hide them. I want them out here where the public can see them because they're directly connected to this memorial. Hi. The three commemorative stones were carved by Boone's Memorial of Sonora. They are Sierra White Granite, and the artwork on all three stones was executed by Air Force veteran and Groveland resident Christina Wilkerson, a graphic artist. The center stone refers to the action and the people lost on 9-11. The original artwork was slightly modified. This stone weighs 2,600 pounds. This stone over here honors those who served in, Af in the Afghanistan war. The original eagle artwork on this stone and the Iraqi stone was executed by Christina Wilkerson. It weighs 1,600 pounds. This stone honors the military men and women who served in the conflict in Iraq. The colorful ribbons are the ones worn by the military personnel who served in that theater. This stone also weighs 1,600 pounds. The following program was produced thanks to a grant from the Sonora Rotary. Rotary, service above self.